How do you conjure power when the world has gone dark? The city's dead. Electricity, gone. But you need power for a flashlight, a radio, or perhaps even something fun. No outlets, no grid, just junk, chemistry, and a bit of chaos. And more importantly, why would you need it? Survival depends on light in the pitch black night. Communication keeps hope alive. A little entertainment can fend off despair. Don't let the silence define your new reality. Before we dive in, if you're serious about surviving the grid down, make sure you hit that subscribe button for Bunker with a view. You won't want to miss our future survival deep dives. We're always finding new ways to reclaim forgotten tech. We build a future from the scraps of the past. And tell me below in the comments, from what blasted corner of the planet are you watching? What's the one crucial device you'd power first if the lights went out for good? Your answers help us tailor future content. Today, we tackle the very core of DIY power. We're talking about making a simple battery. You won't find one on a shelf, but you can build one with what's left. This isn't just theory, it's practical survival. It's about igniting that spark of hope. Understanding how to generate electricity from everyday items is a fundamental skill. It moves you from a passive victim to an active survivor. Power becomes something you create. You'll need a few common items. Two different types of metal are crucial. Copper is an excellent choice, perhaps from old wiring or a penny. Zinc works well too, found in galvanized screws or old battery casings. These two metals form the essential electrodes. Finding these materials might require a bit of scavenging, but they are often more common than you think. Look for discarded electronics or forgotten tools. Rule one, always find distinct metals. They must have different electrical potentials. This difference drives the chemical reaction. Without two different metals, there is no flow. Your battery will simply be a pile of junk. Think of it as a chemical seesaw where the desire of electrons to move creates the current. This fundamental principle makes your DIY battery possible. Next, you'll need something acidic. Vinegar is perfect if you find some. Lemon juice works wonders too, squeezed from forgotten fruit. Even urine, a common and readily available liquid, can serve the purpose. The acid acts as the electrolyte. This liquid medium allows the necessary chemical reactions to occur, facilitating the movement of charged particles. Without this acidic component, the electrons remain stubbornly static. This electrolyte allows ions to move between your chosen metals. It completes the circuit internally. Without an acid, the reaction stops. Your metals just sit there, uselessly. The acid is your invisible bridge. It's the silent workhorse, making sure the electrical potential difference between your metals translates into a flow of electricity. Consider it the lifeblood of your makeshift power source. Finally, you need something to hold that acid. Something absorbent is key. Cloth scraps, torn paper, or even cardboard squares work perfectly. This material soaks up the acid and keeps it between the metals. It prevents direct contact, which would short the cell. This physical separation is vital for controlled electron flow, ensuring your battery functions as intended. A simple piece of fabric can be the difference between power and failure. Gathering these materials is your first mission. Scavenge wisely, observe your surroundings. That old shed might hold copper pipes. A derelict vehicle could yield a zinc-coated bolt. Every piece of junk has a new potential purpose. Think creatively about where these common elements might be hiding. Your ability to repurpose will be your greatest asset. Now, let's make your first battery cell. Step 1. Prepare your absorbent material. Cut your cloth, paper, or cardboard into small squares. They should be slightly larger than your chosen metal pieces. This ensures good contact and absorption. Precision here is not about beauty, but about functionality. It makes sure the absorbent layer performs its duty efficiently. Step 2. Soak your absorbent material in the acid. Immerse each square completely. Ensure it's thoroughly saturated. Consider it the lifeblood of your makeshift power source. Finally, you need something to hold that acid. Something absorbent is key. Cloth scraps, torn paper, or even cardboard squares work perfectly. 
This material soaks up the acid and keeps it between the metals. It prevents direct contact, which would short the cell. This physical separation is vital for controlled electron flow, ensuring your battery functions as intended. A simple piece of fabric can be the difference between power and failure. Gathering these materials is your first mission. Scavenge wisely, observe your surroundings. That old shed might hold copper pipes. A derelict vehicle could yield a zinc-coated bolt. Every piece of junk has a new potential purpose. Think creatively about where these common elements might be hiding. Your ability to repurpose will be your greatest asset. Now let's make your first battery cell. Step 1. Prepare your absorbent material. Cut your cloth, paper, or cardboard into small squares. They should be slightly larger than your chosen metal pieces. This ensures good contact and absorption. Precision here is not about beauty, but about functionality. It makes sure the absorbent layer performs its duty efficiently. Step 2. Soak your absorbent material in the acid. Immerse each square completely. Ensure it's thoroughly saturated. Squeeze out any excess liquid. The material should be damp, not dripping. Too much liquid creates a mess and potential shorts. A controlled amount of electrolyte is key. It prevents accidental energy dissipation or corrosion of your precious metals. Step 3. Start stacking your battery cell. Lay one piece of metal down first. A yase copper coin or piece of wire works well. This forms the base of your power unit. It's your first electrode waiting for action. This initial layer establishes the foundation. It's a critical starting point. Its stability and proper placement are paramount. Step 4. Place an acid-soaked absorbent square on top of the first metal. Make sure it covers the entire surface. This layer separates your metals. It also holds the electrolyte right where it's needed. This is the heart of your cell. This insulating yet conductive barrier prevents the metals from touching directly. It allows current to flow through an external path. Step 5. Put the second type of metal on top of the soaked material. A zinc screw or a piece of galvanized metal is ideal. This completes the metal sandwich. You now have copper, then acid, then zinc. This is your single voltaic cell. Consider it the lifeblood of your makeshift power source. Finally, you need something to hold that acid. Something absorbent is key. Cloth scraps, torn paper, or even cardboard squares work perfectly. This material soaks up the acid and keeps it between the metals. It prevents direct contact, which would short the cell. This physical separation is vital for controlled electron flow, ensuring your battery functions as intended. A simple piece of fabric can be the difference between power and failure. Gathering these materials is your first mission. Scavenge wisely, observe your surroundings. That old shed might hold copper pipes. A derelict vehicle could yield a zinc-coated bolt. Every piece of junk has a new potential purpose. Think creatively about where these common elements might be hiding. Your ability to repurpose will be your greatest asset. Now, let's make your first battery cell. Step 1. Prepare your absorbent material. Cut your cloth, paper, or cardboard into small squares. They should be slightly larger than your chosen metal pieces. This ensures good contact and absorption. Precision here is not about beauty, but about functionality. It makes sure the absorbent layer performs its duty efficiently. Step 2. Soak your absorbent material in the acid. Immerse each square completely. Ensure it's thoroughly saturated. It's tiny, but real. If it zaps you, congrats. You built something stronger. Handle with care, even small currents can surprise. Especially if your hands are wet. Remember, electricity, even homemade, demands respect. A little jolt is a powerful reminder of the forces you're now wielding. No outlets, no grid, just junk, chemistry, and a bit of chaos. You have just harnessed a fundamental force. You have taken control. This isn't just about making power, it's about making independence. It's about pushing back against the encroaching silence. It's about survival, one volt at a time. Embrace this new reality. Your ingenuity is your most valuable resource. 
lighting the way forward in a world reclaimed by shadows. You have built your first battery cell, producing a precious, tiny spark of life. But one volt won't last long or power much in a truly desperate situation. And more importantly, a single cell often lacks the punch to run critical devices like a flashlight for extended periods. To truly reclaim your independence, you must learn to combine these sparks. You must amplify their effect, turning them into a steady flow of usable energy. This next step is about making your power practical and powerful. Mastering the single cell was just the start of your journey toward energy independence. It was proof of concept, a whisper of power from the ruins of the old world. Now, you'll gather the same raw materials as before but with a grander purpose in mind. You're moving from a simple experiment to constructing a genuine, reliable power source. Every additional cell contributes to the overall strength and voltage of your new battery. You'll definitely need your two distinct metals, copper and zinc. Old pennies or sections of wire can provide the copper, while galvanized screws or sheet metal will yield the essential zinc. You'll also need your acidic electrolyte, whether it's scavenged vinegar, squeezed lemon juice, or even a desperate supply of urine. And of course, plenty of absorbent material, cloth scraps, paper, or cardboard squares. These humble components remain the absolute foundation of your energy creation. Rule one, quantity matters now more than ever. You need multiples of each element if you want to increase your power output. For every additional volt you desire, you'll need one complete individual cell. Think of a standard flashlight requiring three volts. That means you'll need three individual cells carefully assembled and connected. Plan your material scavenging accordingly, prioritizing quantity for increased output and sustained function. Step one, repeat the fundamental cell construction process with precision. For each individual cell, you will stack one piece of metal, then one acid-soaked absorbent material, and then the second metal on top. This creates one completed unit, exactly as you practiced previously with your first cell. Ensure tight contact and proper saturation for every single cell. Consistency in construction leads directly to reliability in your overall power output. Step 2. Build multiple identical cells as zinc. You'll also need your acidic electrolyte, whether it's scavenged vinegar, squeezed lemon juice, or even a desperate supply of urine. And of course, plenty of absorbent material, cloth scraps, paper, or cardboard squares. These humble components remain the absolute foundation of your energy creation. Rule one, quantity matters now more than ever. You need multiples of each element if you want to increase your power output. For every additional volt you desire, you'll need one complete individual cell. Think of a standard flashlight requiring three volts. That means you'll need three individual cells carefully assembled and connected. Plan your material scavenging accordingly, prioritizing quantity for increased output and sustained function. Step one, repeat the fundamental cell construction process with precision. For each individual cell, you will stack one piece of metal, then one acid-soaked absorbent material, and then the second metal on top. This creates one completed unit, exactly as you practiced previously with your first cell. Ensure tight contact and proper saturation for every single cell. Consistency in construction leads directly to reliability in your overall power output. Step two, build multiple identical cells as zinc. You'll also need your acidic electrolyte, whether it's scavenged vinegar, squeezed lemon juice, or even a desperate supply of urine. And of course, plenty of absorbent material, cloth scraps, paper, or cardboard squares. These humble components remain the absolute foundation of your energy creation. Rule one, quantity matters now more than ever. You need multiples of each element if you want to increase your power output. For every additional volt you desire, you'll need one complete individual cell. Think of a standard flashlight requiring three volts. That means you'll need three individual cells, carefully assembled and connected. Plan your material scavenging accordingly, prioritizing quantity for increased output and sustained function. Step one, repeat the fundamental cell construction process with precision. 
For each individual cell, you will stack one piece of metal, then one acid-soaked absorbent material, and then the second metal on top. This creates one completed unit, exactly as you practiced previously with your first cell. Ensure tight contact and proper saturation for every single cell. Consistency and construction leads directly to reliability in your overall power output. Step 2. Build multiple identical cells, as many as your power needs demand. If you require 3 volts, carefully make 3 separate stacks of copper, soaked cloth, and zinc. Keep them organized and close together for easy assembly. They are individual units now, but they will soon work in concert to deliver significant power. The quality of each individual cell will directly impact the performance of your entire battery system. Care in this stage is absolutely paramount for success. Rule 2. Polarity is absolutely critical when combining your cells. Every single cell you build has a positive and a negative end. The copper, in our chosen example, is consistently the positive terminal of your cell. The zinc will always be your negative terminal. Mark them if it helps keep track, perhaps with a salvaged marker or a scratched symbol. Incorrect connections will either prevent current flow entirely or, worse, diminish your total voltage. Step 3. Connect your completed cells in series to increase the voltage. This means linking the positive end of one cell to the negative end of the next cell in a chain. Use scavenged wires for these crucial connections. Thin strands from simply try a more demanding load than a single LED. A small radio or a brighter LED flashlight will give you a clear, undeniable indication of success. Verify the output before relying on it for critical tasks. Connect the designated positive terminal of your newly built battery pack to the positive input of your chosen device. Then, connect the negative terminal to the negative input. If your radio crackles to life, bringing in static and distant voices, or your flashlight beam cuts decisively through the gloom, you've succeeded magnificently. This tangible result is your hard-earned reward for ingenuity and perseverance. It means you are truly independent of the collapsed grid. And more importantly, this isn't just about making a simple light flicker in the darkness. It's about communication, about access to vital information. It's about powering that old radio to catch distant broadcasts, to hear if anyone else is out there, perhaps even a glimmer of rescue. It's about scanning for signs of life and hope in a desolate world. It provides a crucial connection to a world you thought was utterly lost. If your battery system works, congratulations. You've gone far beyond the basics of a single cell. You've transformed junk into genuine multi-volt power. If it doesn't work as expected, methodically recheck every single connection, every soaked layer, and every metal type. Troubleshooting is an indispensable part of this process. It's a critical skill that will serve you well in this new, unpredictable world. Learn from every attempt, refine your technique. No outlets, no grid, just junk, chemistry, and a bit of chaos, now scaled up for real action and real needs. You've harnessed the unseen forces of nature, controlled the unpredictable elements around you. This mastery of scavenge power is absolutely vital for enduring the post-apocalyptic landscape. It's what separates the true survivors from the forgotten. To keep unlocking these essential, life-saving skills, make sure you're subscribed to Bunker with a view. Hit that button now and join our growing community of post-apocalyptic innovators. Never miss another lesson that could literally save your life. Your ingenuity lights the way forward. You are the architect of your own power, defining your future one scavenged volt at a time.